Thank you, Jeffrey. I'm with Jeffrey Hawker, and thank you for uh, taking the time to speak with me. I'm um, very curious about where you feel uh, people can go with their permaculture um, ambitions. I've noticed that um, you, your background is in international relations. And so one of the things I noticed you were interested in sort of trying to get people to think more about was beyond their perfect little permaculture utopia. Um, well, that's right. You mentioned about there being two stages in the development of um, permaculture learning. Would you like to expand on that? Sure. But I think it's learning really across all things, and one can apply this framework to permaculture. It arises out of permaculture anyway. But what I mean is, I think I should say before the two stages, we all do exist at two levels, really, don't we? We are individuals, yes, and we all exist within a social, political, economic, whatever you call it, context. I mean, we all understand that. So, of course, we can make changes to our lives, beneficial changes, we believe, through education and our will, and, you know, all the good things we have as human individuals. Um, but maybe, almost certainly, we bump up against limits of the context within which we live. That, you know, our society is not perfect, it's got some things that we might want to do, but more than that, even if we get to be happy, it doesn't mean that everyone in the society is happy, and ultimately that will would probably, very likely, rebound on us. It might not rebound on us, but it might rebound on our kids. I mean, climate change is one big example. You and I can live, you know, if we've got enough wealth and so forth, we, we can maybe see out the crisis, but our children and our grandchildren and so forth will have it. So, so, I mean, all I'm saying is, before we get to two stages such, we are living our lives in a, in a sense in the two stages. We live our individual lives, and if we can, we think about the context we live within and how much that intrudes on our life and how much we can make beneficial changes to that context. Because I think as permaculturalists, we're definitely doing both things. We're not just in a, our happiness in our lifetime. We are obviously thinking about the globe, its future, the other species, what is happening to them. So that's what I'm saying. And, you know, we'll try to move on in a minute, I know. But if we do accept that as a framework, we're not just making ourselves happy. We are actually trying to make the world better. And we think we know what that means. Well, that's our, that's what we're doing, isn't it? We're trying mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. Of course. Everyone does. They don't have to be permaculturalists to do that. Um, the person amassing a fortune by oppressing people and ripping the money off them and taking their surplus and selling them shonky goods, um, they would say the same. We know they're wrong. We know they're wrong. <laughs> and we are. We have better answers. Um, so I'm saying, you know, almost everyone except the total head of it who says, I don't care about tomorrow, says, I live in the world, I do appreciate it, and I'm I wouldn't mind leaving the world a better place than it was when I came into it if I could. You know, everyone says that. What we say is a bit more conviction than others. And, and maybe we have that conviction because we've developed tools. Yeah, well, absolutely. I, I think, you know, I, I think one can be very big and bold about the claims we make for personal culture. Um, we are talking about First of all, recognising the problems that our history and we as humans have, have given us. You know, I mean, what do we do? You take a random list, you could say. I mean, climate change, I said, soil loss, the rivers running dry. We see these things particularly in Australia. Species extinction, the impact that has on human life will continue to have. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and the way we can capture and store and use energy, the way in which we can have our buildings and our land efficiently and comfortably designed. I mean, they're all permaculture principles and practices and practices that I, I don't say that each and every one of those, of course, is not just shared by permaculturalists, but permaculture does have the gestalt of that. It has put it all together. Uh, and I think there is a totality in permaculture that addresses the human condition entirely, as a matter of fact. Uh, this is where we get on the two stages, because it's easy to make the case 
that's the end of what you'll level. You know, if you've got a little bit of wealth, if you've got a little bit of land, if you're willing to understand and work, then you can grow a bit of your own food. It can be organic and clean. You can trap energy and water in ways that, you know, give you a bit of independence from the big systems that might deprive you of it under some circumstances, that give you fuel that maybe frees you somewhat from the way in which the big companies are going to suddenly change the price of petrol and what will go away and all of that. So you can do all that individually within permaculture, but I think that what's always attractive to me is the idea that permaculture has very strong suggestions about how we change the society for the better so that everyone can enjoy the individual benefits. But, but that's that's not for everyone. Not everyone really likes to talk about that because, uh, you know, despite what I've said, a lot of people think, gee, if I can get a bit of self-sufficiency, somewhat self-sufficient, and happiness for myself, that's pretty good. I might call it quits. But I am suggesting that in permaculture, always, from the very beginning, is, is the, the principles and the practice that would take us beyond that, that, that do take us to reshaping our society. Mm. I believe. I think. I hope. I mean, if we don't reshape our society, then we, we have had it actually. I mean, the signs are very clear. But, you know, I, I don't want to be a doomist and all that sort of stuff. But I mean, it, it's perfectly obvious in so many ways we're going in the wrong direction. I mean, who doesn't recognise that? Gee, you've got a few deniers around the place, but they're a minority. It doesn't mean that everyone's concerned to act, but the recognition is very, very pervasive. I believe. And especially, you know, in younger people who have had a chance to think about it and not locked into thinking because you can't escape it because you've got the job and you've got the family and you're living this far from work and so forth. All of which makes it very hard for many people to keep optimistic, really. So the young see the perils and they happily have some youthful energy and optimism, which I think is just as well. I hope. You, you talk about the young seeing the perils, but um, we're seeing an increase in suicide, actually, amongst those young people who feel that they don't have any power to do, to act. And that doesn't mean that they actually know what to do to make the situation different. And well, I mean, uh, Sorry. No, you're, you're right. I mean, the fact is, on the whole, young people don't have the power to act and, and those that have the power to act don't wish to act or feel that they can't act. But I mean, it is true, isn't it? I mean, if, if you're a student in school, if you're, you can talk, you can believe, you can even protest and write and so forth. But I mean, your, your capacity to, to change anything directly is, is by definition is extremely limited. I mean, you've only got the power of persuasion and, an, an example that's true um, I, and I guess I mean there's a lot of you know you suicide there's many different individual factors involved and you know each tragic case has its design yes of course reality but I'm sure the, the contrast between you know many young people's perceptions of the challenge and, and, and you know I, I mean by the way I mean I think you know, that their perceptions and knowledge don't come out of nothing. And I think many of our teachers, um, you know, who have to struggle so much <laughs> to get the recognition they deserve, um, teachers in our primary and secondary schools have, you know, have opened things up for children all over the world, actually. The role of the teacher is a really important one. Um, you know, many of the teachers, I, I'm sure, feel very frustrated, but they have they have opened things up for many children and the children do their own learning and draw their own conclusions. But of course, you know, when they feel their powers, it must lead some to, with other circumstances in their life, you know, to feel they, you know, knowledge is really dangerous in a sense because it just exposes how little influence they've got. But, yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's where you and I come in. Uh -huh. Because, yes. you know, older people, who might have some resources and ability or contacts and some capacity to make change that goes beyond their own individual circumstances to provide a, a way of, of giving a lead. You know, I mean, you know, I must say the young people I come across, and I do not so young, I mean, I'm talking more university students, but um, they're, 
you know, I, I know I'm generalising, but truly, the great majority, you know, I'm talking, I don't know how many, I can't really want to put a percentage on it, but, mm. uh, you know, I would say roughly two-thirds of the university undergraduates that I know of and get into conversation with about that, you know, there's, there's some sort of selection going on there, but so I'm making all the reservations I can. I still find people in their late teens, early 20s are very, very concerned about the future of the planet, global warming, drying up species, um, energy loss. Um, well, of course, they're also concerned about lack of jobs and income and all of that, but I mean, so many of those things go together, of course. I mean, so, mm. very much so, I mean, you know, I, I don't feel a little pessimistic myself about where young people are, even if many of them themselves feel without power. Yeah, so. So how do we um, build this sense that we can achieve more? So you see that the, the bit of a um, dilemma with the two stages, say the first stage is where you create your own happiness and somewhat self-sufficient, perhaps you're even connected with others within a community and I dare not think about gated communities, but if you had something along those lines for your stage one, so you've got a very comfortable existence with friends and family and in a satellite existence how do you then get the energy the mental energy to go to a stage two and what can you do about apart from that persuasion mm -hmm. well i mean i think that the short answer is that we need to be able to stand up and advance causes that we can see the benefit of that will make the society better and enhance the position not just of humans but of the other living creatures that we're in relationship with i mean that's just a broad statement but i think there are any number of particular causes that can take us along the road and i think that we are actually living through them and many many people are extremely active around those causes at the moment so what i'm trying to say is in no sense original or new it's actually happening but it's where we choose our causes and how we advance them that is the critical issue. And, you know, I don't think I couldn't claim, I don't think any one person can claim all the wisdom on this. You know, I think it's open for discussion. I mean, I'm nom I can nominate my issues, but the whole point really is for the, the process to be happening and for people to be discussing and arguing about what they want to do. Now, the school children trying to argue and promote climate change, I think is a brilliant thing. I, I think that's an example, but it's just one example of what I mean. It's, if, if I'm just going back a step, I mean, what we are talking about is a change that proceeds through particular reforms in the here and now that are pushed as hard as we can because we think that taken together, a set of demands is going to change our whole society. But See, we're talking very moderately. We're not. You see, two stage can mean some sort of chasm, cataclysmic revolution, you know. That and and you know, I, I think one has to address that because you know that is a possibility. I mean, of course, revolutions fail. So I'm not saying more than that. If things get really grim in this world, if we persist on for another thirty or forty years as we're doing, and we find that you know, people are very badly squeezed because some nations were producing many, many refugees as the sea mm -hmm. was And the, the threat to the comfortable societies like Australia is hugely enhanced and life becomes a lot tougher. Government becomes more authoritarian. We're much more closely monitored. Those that can't succeed in that sort of society they're pushed to the edge. They don't get any sort of a living wage because they don't have employment. They don't find that the so-called welfare benefits are working. I mean, all of those, they're, they're the immediate, very traditional social disasters which will befall societies when politics goes wrong and when the environment goes wrong. So I'm just saying, I'm not wanting to imagine that. I'm certainly not foretelling it because I think we have other options. But some people would see that that grim scenario unfolding and some sort of revolutionary change happening you know i.e 
everyone comes to their senses and you know says, oh, the permaculture was for the right. We better back backtrack 30 years and do it all over again. Mm, maybe, maybe not. Or, or we go into into a much continue into an authoritarian regress. I mean, that's the trouble. Revolution. Mm. The American Revolution, yes, the French Revolution, yes, the Russian Revolution maybe. Um, but you also get you also get the sent into chaos out of some revolutions in the past. So, yeah. so so we're all trying to avoid that, aren't we? Really we're trying to save ourselves before anything like that desperate scenario comes about. So therefore we're back to the question two stage, what's the the stage from where we are, how we advance our society through sets of specific measures around which people who are thoughtful, who have the freedom to think, there are considerable requirements really. But I think we have to say that because we're humans charting our deliberate and conscious course. It's us that's doing it, no one else, and we have to do it with other people. So. I think the two stages are, you know, one way of putting it is the so-called transitional demands that can be framed in the terms of our existing society that make sense. We can understand the words, we can understand the need, and the need from those words, climate change is one. I think that there's quite a lot that, you know, need a bit of debate. I mean, do we talk about a universal guaranteed wage or income? There are actually arguments for and against that one. There are arguments for and against everything. We can't be afraid of argument. But we have to, to define those propositions that we think are transitional to the society that need to be done for our society to maintain itself, to survive, and to take us to the next stage. And if we don't do these things, then our society won't, won't do that. Um, I guess a more immediate one and I, I know it's so easy to say these things they all require energy they require focus not everyone can do everything at once um, the particular issue that's incensed so many of us that's a reasonable one is what's happening with water in the murray darling basin now yeah. i think as permaculturalists we know why we've got to this sad stage because of the early way that land was treated and the way land was divided up and sold and given to private ownership to do what it like and the way that crops were sown and the soil was denuded and the deforestation and devegetation and everything happened. We know all that. And on top of that, we've got an overlay of current politics where entrenched interests and um, sunk interests with their investment and their capital in, in the existing ownership of the water, um, they're causing this problem. So it's, a, it's not just an environmental, it never was, it's a political problem, a political environmental problem. Now, I'm just saying, that surely is something that, as permaculturalists, we have to see remedied and we have to come up with the best possible answer for the Murray Darling and all those other hundreds of sites that are, yeah. don't get the problems, but are, are similarly affected by all the bad practices to pass them away. Existing politics and best of interests are holding us away from decent answers. So I, I'm afraid I'm only just saying all of the political issues of our society, just about everywhere you look, confront us. I mean, what's going well in our society? In terms of the two-step, where are we proceeding really well? Well, thankfully, there is some progress, isn't there? There are some things. Um, you, you know, it might seem off our topic. I don't think it's off our topic at all. Um, we got marriage equality recently. Yeah. With a, with, you know, a process that many supported. Now, um, some, some sort of equality across ethnicity, gender, age and the like is definitely part of permaculture. I mean, permaculture is not owned by men. I mean, that's a ridiculous thing to say. When you look at the theatre the movement, it, it's very, yeah. you know, I mean, I know a couple of old guys, you know, were fairly influential in it. There's so, been so many women. Um, so permaculture is a friend, I would say, to um, diversity and, and equity and Equality. I mean, those things are part of permaculture. They're, they're, I don't know whether that's always properly understood, really. Uh, you know, people think it's sort of technical gardening or something like that, but it, it, it's it, it's full of social implications, and that that's nearly nearly one of them, really. And so, I'm sure. Oh, I 
I don't know, there would have been some permaculturalists that maybe voted against it. Who knows? I mean, everyone's entitled to their views. You know, permaculture is not a... get diverse views. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're not, you know, we're very open and, and free-minded. Um, but the only thing is we, we understand the way our society is heading. That looks so the same in other people, but we, we have the answers. We do. Yeah. So one of the arguments that I've met with uh, Corrine Brennan recently in discussions was permaculture uh, trains people to design better systems, but doesn't necessarily equip us for advocacy. We're a little bit poor on understanding how to be advocates. And then sometimes maybe we don't have the energy to also do that. Mm. How would you advise us to do better advocacy? Well, I, I can I can well understand that. Now, the trouble is, it, it's a, actually a really hard question to answer because I, um, I, I know you and I, so, you know, have had experience, some experience of advocacy. I've, I've lobbied over the years, um, as many of us have. We go to where we can. Not just the formal political system, that's not right. And that's where I think the consumer movement, you know, broadly speaking, is, is doing the right thing by raising our consciousness about bad products and trickiness. I mean, sometimes it can feed our cynicism, which I think is, is a danger. But on, on the whole, um, many of us, are, you know, I just mean citizens generally, are more alert to the quality of food, what's going on, who's making a profit from it, where it's coming from, the food miles and all of that. that now, that's a form of advocacy that actually has made pretty severe startling advances over the last 40 years or so um, and that's quite I think that's an encouraging example and but what that means is that people with particular bees in their bonnets have focused on not government I mean government and regulation is certainly part of it but it's much much more than that I mean they've had to name and shame companies and they've had to get on to individuals to, um, to, to, to name them um, we've seen a Similar movements in the, uh, you know, again, it's not the first thing you think of, I suppose, but um, and it but is very far from finished, very far from finished. But we've we've seen the consumer revolt in the shareholding rooms, the, yep. the initiation of the, the the three strikes and and you're out, the directors that take too much and rip the company off and so forth and so on. Now, I mean, these are very tender little shoots that got a long way to go before they're mighty oak trees. But they're examples of advocacy mm. that are, and see, I, I don't think it's for a person like me to say, you know, we should focus on this target and how you could you can do it because there's a lot of examples around about people that are focusing on targets and are doing it. The mm -hmm. and and the ways to lobby, I don't think they're mysterious or secret. I think we know a lot about that. We know about crowdfunding, get up has its own method. There are there are many organizations that can show us what to do. So it's not a we don't have technical deficiencies. We know how to name, to shame, to get information, to borrow it out, to publicize it, to send it around the place, you know, and there's the positive aspects of social media. We we do actually know all of that. Our issue is, I think, finding how to free people, give them enough freedom from the weights that are holding them down with job and time and responsibilities and consciousness that make them think they can't do it. You know, how do we encourage people to find the time to write that letter, to lobby, to protest, to go to a street march, what, whatever it is that, that has the impact. And not, not everything is equally successful, I know that, but that's the whole point, isn't it? You've just got to keep pushing. Um, again, we had an. Well, you've got to keep pushing because I remember 40 years ago when you know a number of us were lobbying for freedom of information legislation. We were so pleased when we unexpectedly got it under, of all people, Malcolm Fraser, not Whitlam, for reasons I'm sure we all recall. Um, but but Fraser did put it through, and we were exhilarated, and it had some purposes. And we've seen journalism in the years since able to use those laws to pull out stuff that otherwise we wouldn't know about. However. It's also been weakened, it's been pushed back, they put in exemption clauses. So that job was never finished. It got mm. to a certain point 
we have to keep going. And maybe we let it slip a bit, although now it does seem to be back on the agenda. So anyway, long-winded answer to your question, which is only really, to me, posing the question I'm always concerned about, which is, you know, how do we, you and me and others, as individuals, how can we contribute to empowering other people to the extent that we're, you know, able to think about helping other people to be empowered, to empower themselves. How do we achieve that? Because if that's our contribution, because if people do that, then they they will lobby, they'll demonstrate, they'll make nuisances of themselves, they will yeah. push, they won't take no for an answer. But they'll do all those things that, you know, ever, you know, humble away, one has done oneself to some degree, yeah. imperfectly, inadequately, but a bit. And you know, I, I feel you can, I feel to an individual you can answer that question because you ask them what do they care about, what, what's pressing on them in their life. Yeah. And then you try to encourage them to, to work with some others to strengthen numbers, of course, we all know, mm. and to adopt the appropriate techniques. I'm not saying anything illegal, I'm not advocating unlawful activity here. <laughs> no, 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 there's many, many yeah. of, of that. <laughs> but one has I'm disappointed. Be, ah, yeah. No, all I can say is you have to be a bit clever, don't you? You have to look at all your options. Yeah. I'm only talking which side is. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. I've got lots to think about and hope that um, anyone that's been listening has um, been inspired as much as I have. Oh, well, we will talk further, I'm sure. And as I say, you know, to anyone that wants to talk, here yep. we are. Yeah, here we ready, are. Ready, willing and able. Thank you. Yeah.